Hello and thank you for joining me once again for the Finish More Music podcast. Super, super exciting episode today. The man I've got on the show is a real dance music hall of famer. It's Mr. Matthew Benjamin, aka the one and only Bushwhacker. So absolute legend in the scene. Matt, how are you, buddy? Thank you for joining me on the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Keith. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good, thanks. I'm uh, enjoying this heat wave and uh, yeah, the uh, what was the lockdown? I don't really know what to call it anymore, but um, yeah. It's, it's yeah, the, been, the uh, take your yeah. pick lockdown. Choose whether you want to be locked down or not. We're not sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, interesting times. Yeah, it certainly is. And how have you sort of been throughout these times with all of your works? I know you've got lots of different strings to your bow and we're going to talk about a multitude of those fascinating stuff as we go through have you been you know finding it okay what's been your experience of the lockdown from your music angle and the therapy and all of those things um so uh, mixed emotions if if i was to to think about the last four months there's been a huge array of mixed emotions around what's been going on externally, globally, what's been going on internally for me, um, how I've processed it, um, what fears have come up for me, what hopes and aspirations have come up for me as well, um, how I've viewed work um, as an entity. So, you know, for the last uh, 25 years, th well, I've been DJing for 32 years, but you know, it's been my, my main source of income for most of those 32 years. Um, and then when this came along, it was just like the rug was pulled from under my feet and it was looking like such a great year for gigs as well. I had some super events lined up, um, both solo and with Leo as well. Um, some really big shows and festivals. So, um, in one sense, it's been very difficult because economically um, it was a big, a big surprise, shall we say. Um, but in another sense, there's been quite a lot of benefits to, to being at home all the time. Um, it's been testing at times, but I've got lots of other projects finished or in, in underway, shall we say, um, that probably wouldn't have even got started had this not happened and they range from everything from collaborations with other artists who would have normally always been away on tour and been too busy to um, a video remixing video masterclass um, which is I've, I've spent loads of time putting together um, which I'm really excited about uh, to remixes um, my sample pack came out um, which has been something I've wanted to do for a, a really long time. And where is, where does that come out? Where can people pick that up? That's Loop Masters and Loop Cloud. So I did, I called it Tech Breaks. So, which is kind of my kind of cross genre between sort of techno, tech house and breaks and electro. Um, so yeah, that came out a short while ago and, and yeah, I've been excited about that. It, it's taken me years to do it and, and to get around to doing it. But once I kind of got stuck into the process, I really enjoyed it. So it's been nice to see that see the light of day um and then yes yeah, the the therapy the the psychotherapy and counseling work has has taken off um in the last couple of months actually i i'm just finishing my third year of, of my master's degree and i i've already started working with um with some private practice clients um through my matthew benjamin therapy business or website and um, people that have approached me either on recommendations or referrals or that have got a little bit of knowledge about some of my background and what got me into that line of work and people that felt that they might be able to connect in some way so that's been been really good um, but yeah I've been studying hard working hard um, and yeah just just actually trying to trying to get my feet on the ground and keep them on the ground which is the first time in since I started that I've, I've been at, at home for this long yeah I mean that's 
it's so many years now, like three decades, right? And you've spent a life of being on the road in the studio, kind of. So it's it's great to hear that you've taken the time and and you've you've really looked at it in the most positive way you can to get these all of these projects finished. So I think a brilliant place to start would be the music, and then we'll we'll move forward there into some of the new ventures that you're doing. One of the things that you know you're super well known for is obviously the diversity of your music. And you mentioned there, just even when you were talking about the new sample pack you've got out, um, Loop Cloud, Loop Masters, you mentioned a number of different genres all kind of bundled into one there straight away, just when we were talking about it. So one of the questions that I was really keen to uncover about your creative process is when you sit down, you're gonna write a new track, what informs the direction that that piece of music is going to go in? Do you have an idea? Do you have a plan before you sit down in the studio? I mean, it, it varies. Um, it, it's varied and it's changed over time as well. So how I might have approached things, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, isn't necessarily exactly the same as how I approach things now. Um, if I think of the last few years, my process was uh, sort of, the idea was a threefold process. So I would spend X amount of time bashing out ideas. So I'd just sit down and I'd be like, right, I'm gonna try this, 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 and this. And I'd get like skeleton, and they weren't even arrangements. They were just eight bar, 16 bar, or 32 bar kind of loop sections of ideas that I'd been working on and but it was almost like a sort of speed dating but it was sort of I, I, I'd give it a couple of hours and I go right put it away do another one put it away do another one so I was just it was like kind of painting I was just like you know sketching I was like I'm going to do a sketch and another sketch and another sketch and then and then I'd kind of go back and listen through and then decide which ones I felt had a bit of mileage and then I'd kind of go back in and, and, and play with them a bit more and then the third stage would be to uh, to you know finish arrangements and, and and production and do something with it. So I did a lot of that a couple of years ago, um, and I ended up with I don't I can't remember how many track ideas that I ended up with. Um, and now I'm at a point where I've finished some of them and uh, have put them out. The ones that were half done, I have then given to other people to do remote collaborations with. So, and this is where it's been really fun, is that I've been able to sort of put my hand into this pot of half finished ideas and say, here you go, like, check this out, see if you think you can do something with it. So it's not like I've, I've spent days and days um, finishing a track and then said can you to someone can you do a remix of this it's like it's just a few hours work and 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 then it's like okay what do you think do you want to add something to this and so that's what's been going on at the moment but in terms of what happens to me right now when I sit down in front of the keyboard to play I don't know I, I, sometimes I just want to play and not even press record I just want to sit there and just play and listen to the sounds and just enjoy that moment in time and then other times I get this sort of geeky obsession with like upgrading my plugins and, and, and finding new sound sources and whatever. And I kind of tinker away with this stuff for ages and end up not really making anything very much. And then other times I just have these sort of slight sort of moments of divine intervention where something happens and the spark comes and then I just kind of get stuck in and roll with it and end up with something that I think yeah this is great and and these days those tracks seem to be the ones that take me like three or four hours to finish you know not the ones that I spend weeks kind of kind of sweating over and end up thinking oh it's all right <laughs> yeah totally okay well so there's a kind of whole range of things there from the generating of ideas I particularly love the idea of saying okay these ones I'll take forward these ones I'm not sure what I'm going to do with and collaborate and I think that's such a wicked way to take ideas and you know see if they've still got legs if there's still something in there with somebody else that's brilliant so one of the things then is I know you've got a bunch of hardware you've obviously made the sample pack 
when you sit down, do you like have a sound palette? How are you, because there's a vast sea of possibilities and even whether you're just coming up with your ideas or you're just going to play and enjoy the music, is there something you say, right, I'm going to reach for this sort of thing typically to get you started? Well, yes, there was. Unfortunately, I got some, uh, I had a bit of malware that I, inadvertently attached to my to my big computer my mac pro in in my main studio um and i i wiped everything so i have in the last you know month started from scratch i've got no all the sound palettes i'd created all the presets all the effects that i'd had saved all the my favorite kick drums my you know my favorite everything no longer exist <laughs> so i've wow. gone from from sort of having this palette to not having this palette and i've been really positive and optimistic about it and gone well you know it's okay you've just you know you've you've done your you've done a whole heap of work with all these sounds you've done a whole you know you've you've put this sample back together as well you know it's nice to start fresh and have a clean slate you know um but then sometimes i, I reach for that favorite kick and think oh it's not there anymore oh no so this is the the golden rule of backups and it didn't it wasn't one basically i no yeah i hadn't backed up uh, i thought i had and i hadn't wow so fresh beginnings on that front as well which could be it could prove to be really exciting right you could come up with whole new things that you never even dreamt of before possibly well one thing I've started doing recently and, and I don't have any hold any shame over is I just sample myself. So like I will sample m loops from my own records that I already made to then put into new records or remixes for someone else or, or whatever. And it's like, well, why not? You know, I made it in the first place. What, what, you know, so, so in that respect, I don't really feel like I've lost anything. If I really wanted a certain something, I could kind of go and get it. But, but yeah, I don't know there, there, there are I think it's really important and this kind of can tie in with some of our other conversations to some degree to to hold like to to have uh, a kind of mentality around non-attachment you know I think I think non-attachment can be really helpful and I think with the creative process I mean I can remember so many you know even years and years and years ago when I first started making music and it'd be like an, an Atari ST with a crack copy of Cubase and you know it would crash before you'd saved your song and it would be like that was it you know it <laughs> the end of the world yeah 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 no I I've been there done that totally experienced that and um, one of the things I was keen also to understand I know you had a background percussionist how much of that were you able to bring across into dance music obviously you, you know your, your tracks have great grooves and so on and so forth were you able to lean on a lot of your previous experience how did that marry together yeah in in one really really important uh, context uh, and that's dynamics so I was classically trained um, as a percussionist I was playing percussion in the London School Symphony Orchestra for a couple of years and as well uh, you know as well as sort of learning the drums and, and having a drum teacher and, and, and being part of of this this orchestra it, it part of that particular role was about you know, counting bars and, 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 you know, appreciating, understanding and being mindful of the gaps in between the sounds, the gaps in between the rhythms and the beats and the, and the crescendos and the diminuendos and, the, you know, and, 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 you know, that whole thing about dynamics. And I think, you know, back in the day, I mean, you know, it's still like this now, it can be, but, you know, back in the day, you know, making music with a computer, um, it was quite easy to have everything at the same volume, to have everything on the same quantize to, you know, which worked for certain types of, of, of things. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with, with that. I mean, you know, dance music would be in a right old state if people didn't quantize their kick drums, let's face it, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you wouldn't be very happy as a DJ. <laughs> but, 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 you know, the point being that it was really about that, you know, cat, you know, space and, and appreciation of space and then appreciation of kind of groove and human feel and, and dynamics you know so 
that was something that I did take out of that classical training into into my kind of electronic music. And do you tend to play a lot of the the rhythms in? Um, I know you've mentioned loops and things, but right because obviously a lot of people their timing is is all over the show, so naturally just go to to clicking and and stay in the world of clicking the the notes into the MIDI editor. Do you record a lot of the stuff? because obviously you've, you've got great timing and great skill in that area. Yeah, I mean, a bit of both really. I mean, one of my favorite ways to input percussion and drums uh, was with my old, uh, well, I had two actually, I had, an, a, I had the Octopad and I had a, an SPD-20, a hand sonic um, Roland um, electronic uh, conga, uh, which I used, which had all sorts of other sounds in it as well, but I used that a lot, so it was kind of, pressure sensitive and it had roll buttons on it and there was also a kind of a light sensor that you could sort of almost like a, a theremin type um mini controller device on it so i would i'd love to like you know over the top of the sequence kind of the kicks and and, and or any loops and stuff i'd love to like play a lot of the rhythms in over the top and then when I had the the octopad as well, the drumsticks on that, and um, I really loved that bit of kit as well because it just had a stereo out on it, and uh, the, the 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 audio signal was really pure and it was really powerful. So I used to get so much mileage from from the drums out of that. But yeah, these days, I mean, it just depends what I'm doing. I I, I like not quant you know i like working without the, without quantizing anything and playing stuff in sometimes it's off um my akai mpc touch my um um sometimes it's just playing playing drums off the keyboard you know sometimes it's chucking in loops and manipulating them um uh, you know or sometimes yeah putting them through special processing um actually isotope have just sent me a load of new stuff for processing drums which i'm quite excited about um playing around with um, so is, that so, something, is that something new that they're yet let to yet to uh, release into the world is that something that people can uh, think oh there's something exciting coming very exciting oh wow okay cool <laughs> yeah. yeah brilliant stuff oh, yeah it's, it's really just it just depends i mean i'm not i don't get t totally fixated on it sometimes i like to go into a drum machine with it like with the, uh, that's a plug-in Sometimes I like to do it off the off off the MPC. Sometimes I, I I just like to play the drums that are already like part of 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 Logic, that are, you know, and just play around with them a little bit. But I usually end up processing most of what I do a little bit. So it sounds very much like you're you're someone who throughout the years you've continually embraced all of the new technology and the the things that come out. Would that would that be fair? Very much so. Um, uh, I had a chat with, with somebody else about music production last week and I was just saying that I feel really, really lucky that I didn't go down the, the modular synthesis uh, uh, rabbit hole um, because otherwise I'd have probably had to mortgage my house, remortgage my house, you know, and, you know, that stuff's like, it's so lucrative, you know, you look at it and you think, I don't even know what that does, but I want it, you know, and it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and the idea of having a whole wall full of all this stuff that's in kind of racks and in Euro racks and kind of all flashing lights and, you know, the Starship Enterprise and you're making like the best sounds you've ever heard. But my experience of it has been mixed, you know, it's like, it's a bit, a little bit for me, the Emperor's New Clothes. I mean, how hung up on it do you want to get? For me, it's really about what's coming out of the speakers at the end of the day. You know. Yeah, totally. And I guess the other thing that I'd love to understand is we've talked about the drums and the groove side, but also a lot of your music, you've got really emotive pad sounds, chords and so on. Is that something you've been classically trained in as well? Not exactly, but... Um... My my mum used to play the piano, and when I was very very young, like three, um, I used to sit at the piano and just make up make up tracks, like make up little tunes, little ditties and stuff. So I'd, I'd always enjoyed just sitting at the piano and playing keys. You know, I did have a few piano lessons at some point. Um, I never really did any grades. I didn't. I could read. I, I used to be able to read music. I, I, I would have to brush up on that these days. Um, but I was always very in awe of other people that 
had done grades or you know could could sit in the the, the music rooms at school and just jam away and stuff and I remember there's this one little girl that was um you know you get those little kids at school that wear glasses and they're really 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 clever and, like a little prodigy and, and they're brilliant at everything and she always used to go and sit in the they had these little soundproof like piano booths uh, uh at the at the lunch break and just play and like i'd stand outside like like dribbling like looking through the window sort of thinking you're the best thing ever and at the same time thinking i hate i hate you for being so good at, <laughs> for being so good at this you know um, but um no i mean i'm okay uh, for me my right hand was my jazz hand so i i you know all i i used to watch play and love jazz live jazz when i was a kid and the the my right hand was the one that i could play jazz solos on all day long and my left hand was the chord hand and that still applies now really right so i mean it, it it's great because you've got a lot of experience it, you know one thing that you're clearly an expert in something else that you've loved and still put time into and that organic uh, approach to your music really shines through so one of the things I loved I picked up on you said earlier was that some days you'll just go in and you'll just play the music just for the joy of it and for being in the moment which is great are there times or does anything happen when you're in the studio that you find holds you back things that you don't enjoy might be parts of the process external pressures because obviously when you put a record out you know everyone's going to listen to it is there anything that creeps into the studio that you find challenging still or maybe was something you struggled with in the past very much so and not in the past if i you know if i go back 10 20 years no never i, I like that was my kind of for me that was my uh my golden period of, of freedom where one side kind of like you know found my kind of groove i just was just running with it and rolling with it and all i wanted to do was be in the studio and write music you know um later years recent years um where i really could easily hit a wall would be where i would compare what i was doing to what I thought it should sound like because that's what everything else that people was playing sounded like or what you know what was what was doing well on Beatport so I you know I mean you know I, I hate to to you know admit it but you know it did affect me that I would be like always comparing what I was doing to what I was hearing and because I was DJing a lot as well you know and it would be like you know I, for me it had to sound as good as the best thing I'd ever made or it had to sound like it was going to fit in with what else was happening that turned me on and you know that was kind of okay when it was sounding like that but when it wasn't sounding like that it became a problem for me and I'd be I'd get frustrated because I'd be I would be thinking I'd be questioning my abilities and I'd be questioning is this you know it, Am I still, is there still something that I can do here or have, have I kind of just sort of gone past that point of, you know, has, has my energy gone, gone somewhere else, you know? Um, so I find that difficult. I think, and, and that is so fascinating, I think, because so many people will be listening and thinking, I have those same doubts now and feel that I haven't really achieved anything yet in music. And so I'm doubt, I've got the self doubts of, can I do it? And here they're able to listen to someone who's achieved pretty much everything. I mean, huge, huge tracks, amazing DJ career, same kind of thought process with all that under your belt, but for a slightly different reason of, is it possible that this could have gone? So I think it's really, it's encouraging for people to always hear that they're not alone in these things because when you're in the four walls of your studio, often it feels like it's only me. It's a, a thing that comes up a lot. And even though we often know it isn't, you, you feel like it's only me and I, only I've got this. How did you go about overcoming that? Have you and overcome There that? is a little bit more to, to that story as well, which is that there was a period from about 2006 Six, where Leo and I were releasing, and, and me as well, um, Solo, were releasing some really strong 12-inch, like, like singles. And 
they were just coming out and disappearing within a matter of two weeks. And we knew, because we were DJing everywhere, you know, we knew that they were great tracks. Like, I, I don't mean classics, I'm not going to go that far, like, not, I'm not talking love story, but, but, you know, we knew that they were wicked tracks and they were just not getting seen anymore. And it was just, it was this trends, it was the whole minimal thing had happened and, you know, everything had sort of just changed and, and, and and then some people were like, well, you know, you, you know what you should have done. You should have, you shouldn't have started making modern sounding music. You should have done this. You should have done that. And so when other people are starting to sort of, when you, the new music was coming out and then disappearing and then other people were like, oh no, well, you should do this. And, you know, it, it, it did bring up questions. Um, overcoming it, I think is really a question of, not caring about like that side of things you know and you know it depends i mean what why are you writing the track what why are you writing the track in the first place are you writing the track because you want to be popular are you writing the track because you want the track to sound like um an amazing jamie jones track or, and you want it to sound like that so that you can send it to him and then he might put it out on his label well that's okay you know there's nothing wrong with that that's like you know like I might go in like we went you know when I was writing music for Richie Horton I was deliberately writing music that I thought would sound good on plus eight and minus and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but you know you know with that whole thing about you know is it is it good enough I guess the gauge is you know th does it really matter whether it sounds the same as what someone else has done and you know hopefully it doesn't hopefully hopefully it sounds different but you know do you like it does it make you want to dance you know does it does it make you want to dance if it doesn't make you want to dance why doesn't it make you want to dance you know like you know it, it, and if it's because you're questioning your ability you know just you know you're, you've stopped enjoying the process at that point yeah so it's very much and that yeah, i think you've touched on something brilliant there it's very much the idea of be in love with the process because that that's all there is the the outcome of the piece of music we're not in control of that we nobody can walk into the studio and today say i'm going to write a hit record it doesn't it doesn't work like that creativity is you know the more you do it obviously the, the better you get in certain aspects again following the process but there's always going to be the the, the weeks months where things are a bit dry or a poor day a great day it's kind of unpredictable but the thing that you've always got is the process that's always there. It always exists. And if you love that and the have your own motivations, and I think that would be a great thing to hear from you, which is you mentioned the just being in the moment and the enjoyment of it. What are your core motivations when, you know, your intrinsic motivations, the things that light you up about writing music? Um, it's an energetic thing, I suppose. Um, it's, it's, it's really about the feet. It's about the feeling and it's about the energy. So I really like writing ambient music as well. And like, not that I, I mean, I have released a few ambient tracks with, whether it be on albums with Leo or, or stuff that I've done years ago with like Plank and stuff, but there's just something about enjoying the, the energy around sound and frequency and and i think i got excited again about music um when i released um a new ep on on plank records for the first time in years um earlier this year and um it was four tracks and two of them were breakbeat two of them were electro one of them was in five four time which is just doesn't happen like who's you know you can't mix that and figure out really what's going on i mean and you know but there was something about the energy of it. And when I, 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 you know, I wrote this tune ages ago and I loved the fact that it was in five, four time and it had this crazy tribal frenzy energy around it. But then I was like, when it came to sort of getting closer to putting a record out, I thought, well, I, I, maybe I should just make it in four, four because then people will be able to play it. So I did a four, four version of it and I listened to it and I just thought, nah, you know, this is just like whatever now. But, be, but like the, there's something about the quirkiness of it. So for me, it's about the energy that the, the track's producing, you know, and that doesn't mean it has to be like hugely energetic and everyone always has to be jumping up and down. Maybe you want to write a piece of music that people just want to sit and listen to, you know, like a Niels Fram or, or something like that, like, you know, that, you know, where, where, where it's the most amazing 
sonic experience but you know it, it's not all dance stuff it's just incredible sounds you know but really for me it's about what what is the energy that that the sound is creating that's coming that's coming out of those speakers yeah amazing i i, I think it's it's great just to, to hear the enthusiasm with which you're describing it it kind of lights you up when you're talking about this and the just the feeling of it i love the idea of the frequencies and like the exploration of, of the whole thing so i think this takes us nicely into a relatively new venture for you in terms of when we think across the three decades anyway which is that you're you've moved into now the psychotherapy side of things and you're deeply passionate and interested in doing this work what took you along the steps to to start taking this fork in the journey start adding this to your repertoire well the short answer is addiction and recovery so um I had issues with with drink and drugs over the years and um, I sort of tried over quite a long period of time to address it um, with various degrees of success so I, I had you know over, over a, I don't know a 10 year period I, I had quite a lot of time living a clean and sober life and while I was still at sort of a kind of very successful period in my DJing and production career, you know, I was kind of fighting that battle in the background. Um, and, you know, when I was living a clean and sober life, my life was manageable and, and infinitely better. And then when I kind of went, every time I went back down that route again, through the party and or whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, it just took me into a more darker, darker place. And, and eventually, uh, five years ago, I hit a wall with it and, um, I, I took myself out of the loop for six weeks and went to a very good rehab center in, in Asia uh, that a friend had recommended to me. And uh, for six weeks, I stayed there. And it was, the you know, in, in, in a similar respect to how we started off this interview, um, that was the longest period of time I'd ever been out of the loop. You know, that was six weeks was unheard of for me to be, away from clubs, away from parties, away from the possibility of, of drinking drugs. And, and while I was there, um, I, I had a lot, lot of uh, very uh, educational and inspiring um, experiences, but um, there was uh, various types of counselling going on. So there was cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, there was group counselling, there was one-to-one -one counselling. I meditated every day. Um, at the same time every day for, for, for at least a month um, and you know I did yoga nidra uh, you know and, and so the combination of all of these things and then I sort of came out the other end and I've never looked back I'm still still clean and sober now and, and stuff but I, I became more and more interested in why we do the things we do what makes us the people that we are what what happens in my head when I feel insecure or uncomfortable about something what, what's it about and I just started taking more and more of a vested interest in why we why we are the way we are why people are the way they are and you know I believe that that was really the the catalyst for, for where I'm at now and then um so that was in 2015 and and in 2017, I took I took an entire year um, off social media and journaled every single day. And part of that journaling process uh, took me to to decide to sign up to do a, an online psychology degree. Um, at the beginning of 2017, I I had a very clear vision in my head. It, it was a random thing, but I saw myself sitting in a chair. In a room with lots of books and talking to someone like therapy and I, I'd already been in therapy for years I had weekly and bi-weekly psychotherapy with a great psychoanalyst who I still see now and uh, I journaled that you know I've just had this random thought why don't I do this and that was the beginning of it so I signed up to do a course and then of course, because I'd signed up to do this course, I got impatient and wanted to do 
lots of other courses really quickly uh, and so I, I started looking at lots of different courses and uh, I, I, I was I, I got a bit lost with it and then I met somebody when I was, I was living in Ibiza at the time and I met somebody who had just finished um, a master's degree in transactional analysis psychotherapy in London and she told me all about it and uh, she, she told me how, how great the course was and I contacted the institute and um, did a training weekend with them and, and that that was that was the beginning of the journey for me in terms of the studying. Um, so yeah, I, I, I started the, the, the course in 2018 and um, I'm just finishing my third year now and I've been signed off for private practice. So I've, I'm already seeing, seeing a number of clients um, in my private practice as well as doing placement work at various different services. So I've worked at uh, I've worked at a drug and alcohol counselling service. I'm currently working with a hospice and um, various others that I've done um, alongside the private practice. So that's where I am with it today. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing stuff. We've obviously talked quite a bit about this as well, that this is something that I'm, you know, hugely into and, and, and learn about a lot as well. And I think it's wonderful how you've, you've taken this energy. You mentioned sort of being in the the dark place and as you've been able to to come out of that you're using that f as a force for good to help other people as well and obviously you have people come to you because of your experience in the industry it's natural that creative people are, are going to be drawn to you and people who are djs and music producers and so on what would you say are the biggest or uh, the most common types of pressures and difficulties that creatives experience there's just uh, there's quite a lot um you know and, and it, it's broad so the it's it's not so niche but but you know uh, with creativity um there can be uh, you know a, a massive array of different sense of worth sense of belonging sense of uh okayness or not okayness that that can occur within a very short space of time so it can be it can be quite a roller coaster you know a lot of creative people they kind of they can be quite introverted quite isolated as well um, alone in a crowd is quite common and um everything can hinge on a little bit of news and you know if that little bit of news doesn't come what's going on for, for that person and how are they dealing with it or the aspirations or the you know the the sense of belonging at the point they're at now compared to where they used to be if they they were more successful in the past or you know, there are so many different factors involved but there's a lot of depression and there's a lot of uh isolation and loneliness that can come into it and what would be your sort of key piece of advice to anyone at the moment who's struggling with these kind of things? Hmm. I mean, you know, it, it's important to remember you're not alone, I think is um, something to bear in mind that, that my personal experience around low points, um, low vibration feeling down feeling depressed feeling in feeling stuck is that when i'm in that place sometimes it's really hard to see the wood through the trees and to to feel like anything's going to change you know but it does change uh, you know it doesn't stay the same it changes it's just that you can't see it when you're down there you know so I think it is important to remember that it does change. But talking is so important. Talking, it, it's when you don't talk. And that doesn't mean talk to anyone. You know, it, it's not, I'm not saying who you should or shouldn't talk to, but you're not always going to get what you need by talking to anyone about these things. But it is hugely important not just to keep it in. You know, it is hugely important to be able to voice what's going on for you and to be able to, you know, sit with that and to to be able to connect about it. And, you know, I hope hopefully that's what I'm 
helping some people with and you know outside of the therapy but you know like just people that I talk to within our industry within music and stuff and that, that kind of know a lot of people come to me and they've got friends who have got problems with drinking drugs or or or, or depression or, or not getting any work and stuff and they just want to know either what I did about it for myself or, or what I might be able to kind of say and do and you know without actually working with people and and you know doing counseling and psychotherapy it, it's it is it's not that easy just there's no quick fix there's no no oh here just go and do that and you'll be fine but it, it really is about communication you know yeah i mean that i'll echo this that as you know from my own personal experience which has been slightly different in that i work with a lady i've always kind of referred to her as my mindset coach i think her official title probably would be therapist of some description she's a lady who uh, anna pinkerton's her name she specializes in burnout therapy for people and so I've worked with this lady and it was purely by coincidence. I wasn't going looking for anybody. We met uh, at lunch at an event at one point and I was talking about what I do with creative. She was talking about what she does <clears throat> and she mentioned to me, oh, I've got this piece of work that I'm doing with people that I think would be great for you and other creatives. Probably going to take two years, something like that. Would you like to, to kind of do this? And it's all about the way that we show up for ourselves and how, you know, the relation, relationship with self, I think is the best way of putting it. Whether you uh, are always talking to yourself in a, a negative, aggressive, bullying kind of manner or whether you're showing up as a, a positive caring supporting version of yourself and so I, I hadn't even gone looking for this um but I think we're probably 14 months now of talking once a week and the change it has had on my life has been absolutely dramatic I mean it, there, there is no question the things I've learned the way that I think about the world, the way that I think about myself, the way that I'm able to show up for my community, everything has gotten better. And so when you sort of say about, you know, talk to people, the first step is to talk to people. But I think that when you talk to someone who is professionally trained and they know, you know, they know how to guide you and how to listen to you and the types of things to, to discuss and how to frame things, I think the power of it is is unbelievable and I would recommend to anyone who, who can do it who is feeling in any way that their life is negatively affected, you know, to, to a degree that's stopping them from moving forward. I think you used the word stuck, which I think is brilliant, to absolutely seek out help because it is incredibly powerful and it does work. And I think there's a perhaps a, a stigma that people attach to these things that it's like woo-woo, it's, it's like it's not real stuff. And it really is. And it really does work. Um, so I've spoken about this a few times on the show, just kind of my own personal journey with the, what I call the inner bully and the inner coach. And the fact that I always thought that being brutal to myself was what drove my success. I always thought I was successful because I gave myself such a hard time. And now I've discovered that actually what that was doing was putting me in uncomfortable sometimes dark places were actually hampering me and and it's if you take that voice outside and say well what sort of coach would you respond to if you were on the football pitch or as a piano teacher or whatever would it be someone who's shouting at you and talking to you in the most despicable way possible or would it be someone encouraging inspiring and, and motivating and when I at first I had a, such a hard time getting it I thought you know Everything I've done up to now has been off the back of me. So come on, get on with it. You're too slow. You can do better. He's better than you are. You need to catch up. And all of this kind of really um, sort of aggressive nature in, inside of my head. I'd never dream of speaking to another human being like it. Never dream of it. And yet I was giving myself that stuff. And now that that's coming out the other side, my life is, I'm just so much more at peace and at ease than I used to be with everything that I'm doing, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not there yet. I still turn up for, I catch myself, but you learn that actually you're in control of your thoughts as well. And the more you do it, the more practice you get of catching yourself when you're falling into these patterns and different behaviors, 
the easier it is to gently bring yourself back round. So I don't, that's my experience. I know there's a vast kind of array of, of different um, kind of areas that you could focus on, but is that something that you tend to talk about with people Was what I've said to you just resonated on any level? It's resonated with me on a couple of different levels. Um, definitely. I mean, you know, recognizing that those, those voices so that, you, that you're in a bully and you're in a coach and, and being able to sort of, being able to challenge the way that you are towards yourself is really, really important. Um, I think one of the things that really holds people back is that they know that they should talk to somebody and they often can have a conversation with themselves going, yeah, I, I should definitely do that and mm, I, I, I'm going to do that but they don't do it. And you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, an unconscious fear that they're going to be in some way found out, you know, that, that they're going to like, you know, that the way that, that they are is going to, is going to be kind of like exposed and, and, and that it means that, that they might be faced with the idea of change, which they don't like, you know, and, and that they know something's wrong, but, it's easier to stay in that place of something's wrong for a lot of people than it is to embrace the idea of, of, of coming out of that. And what's interesting about that is that it's often out of their conscious awareness. So they don't have any idea that that's what's really going on for them, but that's what's holding them back, you know? So it's, it's about taking that first step, you know, and, 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 and reaching out to, to find someone to, to talk to about this. And the other thing that I, that I and you, you said you've been doing that over 14 months and it's dramatic, had a d dramatic change for you. And, and there's something really important about that because people often want the instruction manual. And my experience has been that, you know, that some of my clients, they'll, they'll contact me after one session or before they've even had the first session and say, you know, can you, can you recommend me some, you know, what should I do? What should I what, what what should I read? What should I, how should I breathe? What, you know, and, you know, they want the answers. They want a solution-based, you know, scenario. And what I, I, you know, try to explain is that with the, with the counselling and the therapy that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have some good, some good sessions and some sessions will be very uncomfortable. And, you know, it's, it's about sitting together and exploring what's going on for you. And, you know, and, and having a look at you know what might you what might be blocking you from reaching your goals what what might you be doing differently or what what might be happening there for you so it's it it takes time i mean you're, you're 14 months in it can take it can take time it's not it's not always a quick fix solution you know it's saying very interesting that, so go on please saying that um and I, th I think we were going to talk about this anyway, but there is a project that I'm, I'm working on with my partner, which does tie two different kinds of, uh, of uh, holistic, shall we say, and, and, and self-care based uh, activities um, together to really enhance people's experiences. Yeah. So I know you've, you've mentioned this and I, I was, I think it ties in really well actually with what I was about to say because you mentioned around the the quick fix idea and I was someone again who was you know very much like oh I'd love to be able to do this faster is that possible and Anna said to me no it's not about speeding it up but there are things that you can do that would deepen the work different different kind of uh, approach to it um and journaling, interestingly, is something I've always done. And she said, yeah, totally. And the other thing that I've done a lot of is meditating. And she said, yeah, again, that's a, a powerful thing. So I know that's what you're, you're going to speak to. Um, now, my experience of that has been profound as well, because I think there's, a, there's an important 
thing for anybody to realize if you show up to therapy or counseling, the person that you're seeing is responsible to you, but they're not responsible for you. They can't do the work for you. There's a process of self discovery here. And if you choose to go away and reflect on what you've spoken about and think about it and journal about it and meditate on it, then that would deepen the work. Whereas if you just see someone for an hour, then an hour, then an hour, you'll still make progress. And I certainly did because there are weeks when I've been so busy, it's unreal. And I've just seen Anna and we've spoken about stuff and that's gone on for a few weeks and things of the needles moved. But in order to, to really um, enhance the experience, I have found that actually being responsible for myself and not expecting someone else to, to do the work, they're there to facilitate and to guide has been massive. So talking on the meditation side of things, I found that because in, in the, when you're meditating and the, the voice is the monkey mind, if you like, kind of quietens down and you're able to, to get that clarity and that self-awareness, that has helped me massively to solidify the things that I've learned, to catch the thoughts that are coming, to think about, you mentioned where they're coming from. What's, what's creating that block or creating that anxiety to be able to find those things and often to even dissipate their power in what I think is what I would refer to in meditation is like your ultimate safe space. Because a lot of the anxieties and the problems that we feel are based on stories we're telling ourselves, interpretations of the past, meanings that we're attaching to things that are going on at the moment. But actually, it's, it's, none of them are real. They're just things often imagined. And certainly, none of them really affect our safety. Right in that moment when we're sitting meditating, for sure, for me, I'm in a safe space. And I'm able to explore things. And stuff loses its power. And it dissipates much faster than when I'm not combining those two practices together so i've had like really profound things where things i'm anxious about have lost their power in the space of sitting there for 20 minutes that have maybe been things that have troubled me for years and even things that i've spoken about in sessions and it's helped me to turn the dial down a little bit but when i'm meditating the dials turn down even more on that thing to a point that it it just it's not even a thing that triggers me anymore so i found meditation to be like hugely helpful and i i'm guessing that that's one of the reasons that you and your partner are working together to, to put listen up together but yeah i mean please tell us all about that and, and how it all ties together and you're I, I, that, again that's just my experience i don't know the experience that you guys have had you've obviously gone so much deeper into this than i have maybe we have maybe i mean it, you know but, but everything that you just explained sounds pretty much on the level with, with where we're at with it. And uh, so, as I said to you before, when you asked me about how I, I even got into sort of wanting to get into psychotherapy, that, that when I was going through that transition, you know, I, I did meditate every day regularly and, and you know, there was a, a noticeable difference after a certain amount of time um, for my clarity, for feeling grounded. And, and so um, my partner, Belinda, she's, um, she's devoted a major part of her life in the last decade to meditative practices. And she has been out to, to study with her masters in India, in, in the ashrams out there. Um, numerous times i think she's been out 19 or 20 times in the last wow. eight, eight years she was also working very closely with somebody else who who was a guide for her for a lot of her spiritual practices but she's now been at a point for a while where she's been teaching and it's something she's always wanted to do um so she's been sharing some of, of what she knows what she's been taught her experience her wisdom and she's been teaching and guiding people in group classes um, around London and then also been teaching online and doing one-to-one -one work as well as been working with sound therapy um, to complement that. And over, about a year and a half ago, I started speak, speaking to her about this crossover between you know, the, the, the psychotherapy side of things and the, me the meditation side of things. And, a lot of her master's um, practices and, and, and 
conversations uh, were about the, you know psychotherapy with, within meditation as well. So Osho is one of the people who had a lot of friends who were very good psychotherapists and, and they would often talk about how one, one thing would complement another. So what we're doing um, is we've started a company, um, we actually registered it about a year ago, but we're going to be launching probably in autumn um, called Listen Up Therapy. And Listen Up Therapy is it's a fusion of meditative practices and techniques, including some breathing work, some breath work, um, including some yoga nidra practices, and then psychotherapy. So, but they're not happening in the same room at the same moment. They're, they're under the same umbrella. So listen up therapy is comprised of listen up and listen in. And the listen up end is the psychotherapy side of it and the listening is when it is meditation and other practices side of things and the concept really is about how by using these meditation techniques breathing techniques yoga nidra to help you to become more centered more grounded more aware have some more clarity and to you know connect more with your inner world rather than everything that's external affecting everything that you do um, to help you get the most from the psychotherapy as well. So as you mentioned, you know, how much more you benefited from your therapy and coaching sessions because you had been meditating and you had been doing certain things. So what we wanted to do was to create something for music industry, a little bit broader than that for me it was about people initially for people who work unsociable hours so right across entertainment tv film um tour touring production um, post-production music entertainment um but initially we're going to be thinking music industry um as the kind of main demographic and it's going to be you know people can come to us and, and people can work with some of Belinda's teachings for that side of things, for the, for the listening side, and can work with myself and some other psychotherapists and counsellors that will be working for me and with me. And we can help people to get where they want to get to and to connect with people who will have an understanding of where they're coming from. I think it's amazing. I, abs I absolutely love it. I think you guys are onto something as well. I mean, I, I can only speak of my own experience. I'm not an expert in any way. I'm just someone who's on this journey and can speak of the profound nature of the changes. And I, I actually picked up on something you said there, which is also true of me. I found it to be two way. So whilst I can, I will meditate and things that I've spoken um, about in my therapy session and different ways to reframe things will often sort of grow and, and flourish when I'm meditating. Simultaneously, I'll have breakthroughs that I can then take in the therapy session and say, I realized this, it's like a light switched on. You know, you have these kind of light bulb moments of this thing happened and this worked. So I thought this and, and, and then we can kind of discuss that and unravel it, I guess, in a way. And I, I think that's an important thing just for people to realize there's a, you know, you, as a therapist, you'll ask people a lot of questions that you see things and hear things and understand things with your depth of knowledge and help them to explore and uncover things as well as explain why things are happening. And I think it's powerful because we're all, we've all got different thoughts and things, but essentially there's a lot of wiring it that is the same. And you realize that, okay, we're, we're all in this together. I'm not alone. I'm not on my, my own here thinking these things and having someone who's a professional who, you, who can guide you through that and now as you're saying because I just sit and meditate on my my own you know and and I can totally see what the benefit would be of having someone with the experience that your partner's got being able to guide you through this as well I think what what an incredible combination I think it's awesome well I, I think we're gonna thank you I, I think we're gonna look at it from lots of different angles so um 
there will be the possibility for bespoke tailored one-to-one um, -one sessions with Belinda. Um, and there will also be courses that are video courses that people can do in their own time when it suits them. You know, I mean, they might be in a hotel room somewhere, they might be at home, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna be, here are the tools, here are some of these tools, you know. And then there are possibilities that it can um, work parallel with the counseling and therapy or that one can lead into the other. So, you know, they somebody might choose to, to spend six weeks working with Belinda's teachings and then go into therapy or they might decide to do both at the same time so you know there, there have been a lot lots of different ways to skin a cat you know so. yeah I, well i think it sounds great so how will people know when this is launched where where can they sign up or what can, can where can they follow social media so that they can keep on top of this to know when this is this lands and they're able to take advantage of this so we, I mean, we built the website a while ago, but we haven't made it public yet. Um, we're still working on content and we're also talking to various people that are involved in different aspects of the industry. Um, some of them are specifically within the music industry. Some of them are a little bit uh, broader and involved in, in, um, in, in concepts that are offering services for people that are less privileged or have lost income. So we won't be um, running the company as a charity per se, but what we are looking at doing is um, connecting with some people so that we might be able to subsidize and fund some people's therapy and some people's sessions that have, you know, that are in a, in, in a position right now, as a lot of people are within the music industry and entertainment industry, where they've lost all their income so we're still looking at that and that's why we're not launching for a while yet um so as to where people hear about it well it will be through through uh some pr through some um advertising and marketing that we're going to do and and uh, some more interviews that i'll do and and through my channels through my social network channels so totally and i mean obviously as soon as it's out let me know i'll shout about it on this podcast so everybody is listening now guaranteed i'll let you know where the when the how so that you can get involved with this for sure well i think that's a, a brilliant way to to end the the interview uh, on this high of knowing that this great thing is coming for sure um was there anything else you you wanted to add before we sign off no i don't think so i mean if people are more, are interested in in you know where where i'm coming from and and with the counseling and therapy work they can they can go and check out my website matthewbenjamintherapy.com so that's already up and active and and I'll, I'll be happy to kind of answer anyone's questions like privately if they email me through the website and if there's anything that, that i can help with that they might want to know about so yeah fantastic hit you up there then well listen thanks very much for uh, for coming on to the the show it's been brilliant i love the breadth of things that we've been able to talk about here as well and how it all ties together been absolutely brilliant so thank you very much buddy and once the once listen up is is out as well i'd love to do a part two with you and once you've uh, you've been running it for a while we can talk more in depth about all of the things you guys are doing love to and we'll bring belinda in for the interview as well yeah it'd be amazing brilliant well take care then buddy i'll speak to you soon <laughs>